Thank you for having me today, Abby. I appreciate the invitation to come speak to all of you about um, baking quality into your online course materials. Uh, my name's Jamie. Uh, please feel free to refer to me as such in the chat. I've been with SUNY for uh, SUNY system for about two years now. And before that, I was an instructional designer at SUNY Broom Community College here in uh, upstate New York. In addition to that, I was an instructor. So I've taught online for almost two decades, which is crazy to say. But in those those 20 years, I've, I've built more than my fair share of course materials and worked from with uh, learning management systems from Lotus Notes to Blackboard to um, Desire to Learn, et cetera. So I understand the, the uh, amount of work that goes into creating these materials and the, the fears that a lot of faculty members have when they're approaching the design of these online course materials. So I'm hoping that after this talk, you'll, you'll feel a little bit more at ease. You might be inspired a little bit to explore some new technologies, some new things for your, your teaching materials. And I'm, I want to talk to you about how to bake those, uh, bake that quality into your online course materials. And, and that doesn't just mean fully online courses. That means any materials that you're posting for your students to consume in a digital format. So whether you're intending to supplement your face-to-face -face courses this fall, create a fully online course or develop materials that will allow you to be flexible for whatever this fall brings us in this age of COVID-19, I, I hope that you'll at least find some of what I'm presenting helpful today. Today we're going to discuss some things to consider in the development of those digital course materials. And, and I hope you'll indulge me in uh, using a very extended me metaphor for baking throughout the, the presentation today. And I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with the British Baking Show. Uh, it's my absolute favorite show and it has pulled me through the quarantine uh, with its good natured contestants and, and the good baking that you see on it. But I also discovered another show called Nailed It. And this show is uh, a show in which contestants are tasked with creating or recreating a culinary masterpiece with very limited skills and limited time. And it struck me that the show nailed it is a perfect analogy for what happened to a lot of us this spring. We had materials that we'd been teaching in the classroom. We were really comfortable with that material and presenting it in a certain way to our students. And it felt comfortable with the of information that the students were able to acquire and then um, demonstrate their learning. And then all of a sudden we had to make this rapid shift to online with potentially limited technological skills or access to the technology that you needed to make that change. And so it reminded me a lot of this show. But now as we're planning for the fall, we do have that time to acquire the necessary skills and the time to develop the materials that serve the needs of our students and help us help the student achieve our stated learning objectives. So when we consider the materials or the course that you want to build, it's often helpful to keep a few things in mind. First, we set the menu ahead of time. You know what skills and materials you'll need beforehand, and, and that's in incredibly important. But just as important is to remember that it's easy to get overly ambitious and try to do too much the first time you're offering online materials. Instead, it's, it's, remember, it's okay to think small and simple. Focusing on the handful of things you intend to do will allow you to do them with precision, finesse, and the end product will be something your students will enjoy. Think of these small desserts on this page here. Just a few simple ingredients are involved, and yet the end result is something recognizable, visually appealing, and digestible. I like to use the example of a restaurant um, in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I was, I'm originally from, and that restaurant's called Melt, that serves only grilled cheese sandwiches. It's a limited menu, but it's honestly the best grilled cheese sandwich I've ever had. And, and we, can, um, we can keep that in mind as we're de developing our online course materials. We can do those, those small things very, very well. So set your goals reasonably. Understand, your, understand that your students themselves, first and foremost, want to enter a digital classroom that's easy for them to navigate 
It's not overwhelming with lots of links and information. And it's liberally sprinkled with excellent and frequent interactions with, the, with their instructors and their peers. Uh, data show that the thing that students respond most to is a faculty member who's uh, engaged, who has what they call immediacy, uh, willing and able to respond to questions in the chat and email, et cetera, more so than the, the course content itself. Uh, students really want the immediacy of the faculty member there. So keeping this in mind, the, the simplicity and, and the immediacy of yourself as a faculty member will help you envision a great course. So now we need to get comfortable in this new kitchen. Uh, as with anything new, there is, there's absolutely a learning curve. And for many, that learning curve, as steep as it is, can be intimidating. Often when faculty are exploring moving their content online, they can become overwhelmed with the choices uh, of technology and um, the different tools that people are using to uh, demonstrate the course materials or have the students demonstrate their learning. Um, and faculty can become uh, overwhelmed about their perception of a lack of skill, right? But if we focus uh, keep our focus on the fact that online learning is not about the technology at all. It's about teaching. We're already going to be a step ahead. The technology is just a tool. It's an extension of our teaching so that we can promote the learning for our students. We do need to learn new skills, however, uh, so we need to focus on the important ones. You get trained in the learning management system that's utilized by your campus and uh, the learning management system is otherwise known as an LMS, and it depends on which one your campus uses, if they use Desire to Learn, Blackboard, Moodle, Sakai, et cetera. And then once you learn the, the basics of your learning management system, go beyond those, uh, go beyond the minimum that's required in order for you to maybe get authorized to teach online if that's a requirement on your campus, so that you can understand the full options and power of the LMS to help you meet the needs of your content development and course delivery. You can contemplate whether or not you need other tools outside of the LMS to meet your learning objectives, something that you can't do, and something you can't do until you truly understand what your particular LMS has to offer. And then if you need it, allow your pedagogical needs to drive the exploration of other technologies such as Zoom or Padlet or VoiceThread or Whiteboard FI or any of the other technologies that your campus supports. That being said, if you stick with information from the previous slide, starting small will help you limit your need to explore other technologies and, and acquire those new skills, all of them immediately, right? You can, you can always add new things next semester. Just, just let the pedagogy of, of what you need to teach this semester drive that minimal implementation, and then you can continue to add and develop and refine your course in the coming semesters. For me as a baker, I've always enjoyed this recipe book, and it's called The New Best Recipe, and there was another version which I have as well called The Best Recipe, and I like it because it takes a scientific approach to baking. It explores what happens when you manipulate each individual ingredient in the recipe, when you omit one, when you add another ingredient, et cetera. And then it determines which combination of ingredients, cooking techniques, and tools will produce the best recipe and therefore the best tasting food. So one of your distinct advantages as you prepare to pivot your pedagogy into the remote modality is that you are following a long line of great online instructional over innovators who have already worked to create a foundation of information and support for you. So as you start to build your courses, you don't need to engage in any trial and error learning like the editors of this cookbook did. There are plenty of recipes to share and recipes that lay out step by step by step the instructions for how to develop the course materials. People have developed timelines, action plans, lists of questions to ponder, materials for various disciplines, and detailed instructions for how to create the course that you want to create. And where do you find these recipes? Your own teaching and learning centers on your own campus more than likely have a lot of uh, these resources for you. And, and these links 
here that I'll provide in the next slide have an abundance of resources for you to use as well. Here are a few example of these resource, examples of these resources you can use as your best recipe guide in the creation of your course content. The first is to the Online Learning Consortium. Uh, the Online Learning Consortium is an international organization that focuses on digital learning and teaching for higher ed. And uh, they offer a wide range of workshops and host some really great conferences, including Innovate and Accelerate. And they, those conferences are amazing to attend if you ever have the opportunity. They did um, one of their conferences this past spring was supposed to be live, got canceled due to COVID. Uh, they did the virtual uh, conference in June and it was amazing. So I really encourage you to, to explore those as options. The, Next option for you is the your AMS website, which uh, Abby has has showed to me. It's great. There are a lot of good resources for all of you and very specific to your discipline. Next down the list is the Teaching Online Preparation Toolkit or Top Kit. This uh, particular website uh, provides a lot of free tools, uh, techniques, and strategies for uh, online content creators and instructors such as yourselves. Most of them are, are free and they're really of high quality. It's a consortium of, of the Florida State um, University uh, offices of, of distance learning and they provide a lot of great content. And then the next, two, next three links here are the playlists that have been offered from the SUNY Pro, uh, Center for Professional Development this last spring in response to COVID-19. We did a remote teaching clinic in April, in March and April, and then we did another one for accessibility online, and then we just completed another series of webinars called the Practical Course Design Webinar Series, and those videos are all available free for you to use. They're on our YouTube channel for the Center for Professional Development, and I encourage you to take a look. There are about 60-some videos for you to peek through. And then we have the Online Teaching Gazette, which offers uh, stories and, and um, information from SUNY faculty and, and other associated uh, partners with SUNY about their experiences with teaching online. And next, what I will get to is the Oscar rubric, which uh, for me is the absolute best recipe for course design. And while it says it's SUNY's best recipe, the OSCAR rubric has been adopted by the Online Learning Consortium, which I just mentioned in the previous slide, and is available free of use. It is an open uh, resource for people to download, use, they can review and develop and review their courses um, at their leisure, and it's entirely, uh, there's, there's no strings attached, right? So that's why I think it's the absolute best. And I'm gonna walk you through why uh, components of this Open SUNY Course Quality Review rubric make it really easy for you to develop course content. The OSCAR rubric is an interactive checklist for course development and review that was adopted by the OLC. It's open source and free to use and is intended for people to use as they develop their new course. It encourages peer review of the learning materials and instructional designer review of the course for usability and accessibility. This is entirely voluntary. It's, it's a suggestion, um, but it, it might help you to have a peer who is also a mathematics instructor, professor, go through the material with you, or you guys can co-create, et cetera, as you're working through the OSCAR rubric, and then you'll be assured of having quality course materials for your students. So let's break down the uh, ingredients list of the OSCAR rubric. It's broken down into six standards. The first is the course overview and information standard. The next is course technology and tools, followed by design and layout, then content and activities, interaction and assessment and feedback. And I'm gonna cover each of these standards in more depth in the subsequent slides. But in order to do that, I need to take a break from baking. Uh, the, the metaphor didn't quite extend all the way to the, the different standards for the OSCAR rubric, so you'll have to humor me just a moment as we switch from baking to pure OSCAR here. In the course overview and information 
uh, standard for the OSCE rubric. What they really discuss is the value of each of these different things as you welcome your student into your course. The information contained within this slide, uh, making sure, ensuring that they are available and well thought out and laid out for your students as they progress through these course information documents makes for um, a student who's well informed about expectations in your course, about what technology is required for them to, to have in order to be successful in your course, what they can anticipate learning in your course, et cetera, and, and most importantly, how to interact with you and what the expectations for that interaction are going to be. Are you going to communicate through uh, Zoom? Are you going to communicate through email, uh, through the your learning management system, et cetera? And what are the hours surrounding that communication? Are you available on weekends, in the evenings, et cetera? So providing the students with these basic documents will help the student become acclimated to your course and will promote their success within your course. It's also a great way to make sure that the learning materials that you develop uh, are, you have a nice synopsis of those and your course information documents are going to match what you're presenting there. The next standard is the technology and tools. And we, I mentioned this briefly in the previous slide, but when, when we talked about going outside of your learning management system, if, if not all of the tools within that LMS meet your pedagogical needs, and if you say explored Padlet or VoiceThread or Whiteboard.fi, and, and these are tools I think that some math professors are, are using currently, um, you need to make sure that your students are aware of these other technologies uh, if they need to know how to um, download something from one one site and then upload it into the learning management system if they need to know how to convert a Word document to a PDF or an image file to a PDF, etc. So we need to communicate to our students every single technology and tool that they need to be familiar with in order to be uh, comfortable with their course. And, and you know what those technology and tools are and you know perhaps how challenging it was for you to adopt something new. So understanding it from the student perspective will help you to uh, indicate to the students what, what skills they need to achieve. In addition to that, when we're looking at technology and tools, we need to keep in mind that accessibility is key. So if you find a technology that meets your pedagogical need, it's also incumbent upon you to determine whether or not that technology is accessible. And that means that a student with a limited vision or auditory um, disability or movement disability, et cetera, can access those tools the same as a student without a disability. And your, uh, your campus itself probably has a student support office that can help you in determining whether or not your technology of choice is accessible. And truly, just as important as anything else is the design and layout standard. And what you'll find is a student will go into a course, and if that course is organized, if it's built in a way that it makes sense, they come in, they click on one thing, it leads them to the next thing, they're not overwhelmed with a ton of text on the page, they're not overwhelmed with flashing uh, lights and, and lots of moving graphics that overwhelm them, uh, color choices are great, et cetera, then the student is more likely to uh, take the time to read through the materials that are presented and embrace the materials that are presented to them versus a, a course that is that is, doesn't meet these design and layout uh, standards. It can become overwhelming to the student, which might lead to frustration or them not wanting to access the course anymore, which then impedes the, their success in your course. So when you're looking to contemplate the design and layout of your course, I highly recommend you click on that uh, practical course design playlist. There were a couple really great presentations given in June uh, from our SUNY faculty about the best practices for, for course design. But really what you want to keep in mind is when you're looking at a website or when you're looking at a, some text on a page, what works best for you? 
if you see something that is consistent, it's, uh, it looks the same from, from week to week to week. The, the text is presented in a way that's not overly, um, there's not like a thousand words of text, it's broken up with bullets or white space, et cetera. It looks better, it feels better, it's easier to digest. When you are adding your images, you're, you're making sure that they fit in with your text and that th they're accessible to your students and your tables are, and your um, slideshows are done in a way that are A, accessible, but also visually appealing. You'll find that students are a lot more forgiving of, of some of the other hardships that we experience with online course delivery if they feel like they can navigate through your course and that it looks pleasing to the eye. It can't be underestimated how important the aesthetics of your course are. The next standard is content and activities, and this is really the meat and potatoes of your course. This is, uh, the, these are the resources and opportunities that you're providing your students for interaction with one another and with yourself, um, for them to learn from each other, to collaborate, to, um, to, to, to share, right? Like they're gonna be doing in business anyway. Um, so we wanna, the Oscar rubric really encourages the, the collaborative uh, type of learning. It also includes learning activities that uh, support the um, acquisition of the information that you're trying to impart and uh, promotes experiential learning, case studies, and problem-based activities. I apologize for the spelling error in there. And if anybody's familiar with OERs, or Open Educational Resources, uh, the OSCAR rubric really promotes the use of these Open Educational Resources because they tend to be free or low cost for your students. Uh, the OSCAR rubric itself is an Open Educational Resource. It's free uh, for, for use. And there are lots of great OERs for mathematics in particular that uh, you can consider utilizing within your course to reduce the cost for your students. When you're developing those content and activities for your, your courses, it's important to adhere to copyright laws. And if you have any questions about that, your campus librarians are more than uh, willing to share their expertise on the copyright. And then you need to, again, I mentioned this in the technology and then the uh, design as well, accessibility of your online con content is paramount. We need to make sure that it's, it's accessible to all of our students. And that includes text that, text that we might add, images, hyperlinks, et cetera, any materials. It's important for us to set, and this is a, the next standard, interaction. It's important for us to set communication and feedback expectations for our students. When will we be available to email? When do we have open office hours, either face-to-face -face or remote in this case? Uh, we set expectations for netiquette, how we anticipate that students should behave within the discussion forums or other chat uh, areas. Uh, we explain what it means, how, how their interaction in the course will impact their overall grade, when they, should be a, when they should be participating, how often they should be participating, et cetera. And we need to make sure that when we're developing these online course materials that we're providing these opportunities to get to know one another, to develop those same types of relationships that we do in the face-to-face -face classroom. It is possible to to develop these relationships, to get a, get a feel for who your students are and understand who your students are. Uh, we have lots of great examples that are linked to with the OSCAR rubric um, materials. And finally, assessment and feedback. It's really essential for all of us to set clear grading policies, uh, to let students know what their participation in a certain gradable activity will how it will impact their overall grade, and to make sure that your grade center is, is set up in a way that reflects those grading policies, providing frequent and appropriate assessment rather than having just a single uh, final exam or a midterm and a final exam that are really high stakes for the student, providing a lot of formative assessment opportunities where students can 
can demonstrate their understanding of the, the material and then get a quick check if they were a little misguided or a little off on their interpretation of one, one thing or another. They get the, the feedback from their instructor and they can make that quick course of correction before it becomes this, in math in particular, right, as you're learning one thing, it scaffolds and builds on the next. And if you make a mistake in, at, at one point, it just cascades. So if, if we can provide these formative assessment opportunities where students can, can determine if they're on the right track or not, and then, uh, then they can make those quick course corrections. The, rub the uh, implementation of rubrics are incredibly important. Uh, they might be a little bit more helpful for the humanities and, and other uh, particular disciplines, but for mathematics, we know that you're looking for very specific things within your course and having a rubric to allow students to understand what those, those objectives are is very helpful. It's also helpful to have uh, to provide your students with an opportunity to provide feedback. Uh, sometimes in my online courses, I will at about the third week put out a quick informal survey to my students asking how they're doing as they're navigating through the course materials. It, do they have any questions about where materials are, how they can find it? Is there something I can tweak that would make things a little bit better? And then again, I, I check back in after about the midpoint uh, just to make sure that the students are, they understand how to check their grades, they understand they're still able to find the information they need, and, and they can demonstrate their understanding to me in a way that they feel comfortable with. Students tend to really uh, appreciate that opportunity to provide the feedback, and I've gotten lots of great feedback over the years. So let's get back to baking. Um, here I'm going to jump back into my metaphor. And as with any recipe, uh, and particularly during quarantine, <laughs> when we can't always go to the store at, at a moment's notice just to get one thing, and, um, and we might not have everything on our ingredient list for a recipe, or sometimes even when we do go out, the stores aren't well stocked, we might need to find some sort of substitute for an ingredient in the original recipe. And, uh, for example, I wanted to make recipes of pancakes this spring, and I didn't have any milk uh, to, to incorporate in the, into the batter. And I, I used yogurt because it was a dairy product, and I figured it was kind of a good substitute. And it turns out that uh, the higher acidity of the yogurt uh, made the pancakes super fluffy, and they were absolutely delicious. And they were the best ones I've ever made, and now I continue to use yogurt in my pancake recipe. Um, and they had more protein. It, it was in that instance where I didn't have what I needed and I just thought outside the box and, and I, I substituted one thing for another. You can do the same thing with developing materials for your online course. Perhaps you have a learning activity that you employ in your face-to-face -face course that works really, really well, but that you, can't, you simply can't um, replicate online. In many cases, it's, it's absolutely appropriate to substitute. There are a lot of examples of creative solutions and alternative assessment strategies throughout um, the SUNY campuses. We have lots of information on our SUNY website that's freely accessible to you. Uh, the Top Kit also has lots of examples of alternative assessments and strategies for you as well. Or maybe you need to re-envision what you've done in that face-to-face -face classroom to met or meet to better meet the options that you have online. Either way, just remember it, it might look different, but it's, it's okay, it's still gonna be okay. Next to dietary restrictions. If you or any of your family members or friends have a food allergy or an intolerance, this, this slide here should, should resonate with you. Say you invite a, a group of colleagues over for a party, not that we can do that right now, but say we, we can at some point, uh, you were planning on making a decois, right? And this is a, a decadent cake that's made with meringue uh, and nuts and chocolate. And you might inquire of your guests before they arrive whether or not they have any allergies. And you, you're uh, relieved to hear that nobody has a nut allergy, but one of your guests has an egg allergy. And if you know anything about meringues, meringues are made from egg whites. So, you have a guest who's coming to your party, you wouldn't expect that guest to bring their own dessert. 
or worse yet, to go without dessert while everyone else enjoys some. It's the same for the accessibility of your online content for your students. In this case, you could make the meringue with uh, chickpea water, which is here in this image to your left. It makes the same meringue flavor and texture, but without the eggs that causes an allergic reaction for one of your guests. So keep your students' access to the course materials in mind when you're developing it. Make sure your videos are captioned, images have al alternate text, etc. There are some great videos, and we have that accessibility playlist on the Center for Professional Development YouTube channel if you're interested in, in watching. And in keeping the, there are, there's one video in particular where, where I discuss the top 10 accessibility issues in your online course materials. And in just keeping those top 10 things in mind, your course will become more accessible and it doesn't take very much effort. Most importantly, with the example I provided earlier, you would never want a guest to come to your home and then you have to scramble and make dessert for them. And that would be like forcing a student to request an accommodation for your course content. It puts that student in the uncomfortable position of having to ask you to reveal their disability and to potentially wait for you to create other content for them when they should be focused on learning. So building your course with this accessibility in mind will help to minimize that discomfort and the inconvenience for everybody involved. So for you guys, for you all, what are the most common dietary restrictions you've encountered in your teaching experiences? I'm going to open up the chat here. Does anybody, has anybody experienced some um, dietary restrictions or accessibility requests that they've received, visual impairment, definitely that's some of the topic. Extended time. And that's one I want to clarify, accommodation, when you get a, an accommodation request for uh, allowing time and a half on an exam, for, for uh, example, that's, that's a little bit different when I'm talking about accommodations um, are not accessibility. I'm talking about um, having a student that you have an image in your course and you don't have an alt text for it. So the student has to request that you provide alt text or if you have a video that's not captioned and they have to request a, a transcript or they have to request the captions, that's an accommodation that we're trying to avoid there. Color blindness, that's a good one to remember. Uh, sometimes when we're choosing the color for our, our uh, text versus our background, we wanna ensure that there's, uh, we're we're mindful of those with color blindness. Yes, uh, auditory impairments. So it sounds like we have a lot of people who are experiencing the same kind of requests, accessibility requests for vid uh, visual, audio, and um, also those that go with uh, motor disabilities for people who can't necessarily use the mouse, they need to navigate um, with the keyboard or they need to navigate with uh, eye tracking, et cetera. Jamie, there's was... one note in the text about colorblindness, sure. which I think is a really interesting example, specifically in mathematics, where we're, um, we make so much use of visual representations. That is, uh, that is and using sometimes a, a red marker or a red color to highlight something, maybe with an arrow or circle. Yeah, we need to be aware of when someone can, uh, they see things in monochrome, when they don't see red, they see it as a gray, and they're seeing that gray against the black text. It's hard for them to distinguish that they're different. So we have to be very, very aware of the contrast for, um, for monochromatic viewers. Great point. Oh, sorry, my watch was talking to me. <laughs> um, so as with most things, students prefer courses that are really easy to navigate. They provide clear instructions, uh, sometimes in multiple places, because not all people navigate to the online, uh, through the online materials in the same way. And a lot of learning management sy systems uh, offer numerous paths to get to the same material. So offering, uh, in addition to uh, really clear, simple, and consistent information, it's to provide redundancy within our courses. So say we 
use our course announcements to provide instructions for that upcoming week. But then within the module, we also provide the same instructions. And then within uh, maybe in another area in the course, you're presenting similar instructions. Providing those redundancies with the course really speaks to students who navigate in slightly different ways. Those that use the, the main body of the LMS or use the course links on the side, et cetera. Uh, it's really helpful to provide that. Co creating content that's consistent from week to week, module to module, makes it easier for students to progress through the materials and helps them predict what's coming next. It makes the whole course more digestible. I like to put this in terms of cognitive psychology, where uh, people develop scripts and schemas as mental shortcuts to reduce cognitive workload. I mean, we're all cognitive advisors, right? We like to take these shortcuts to save the amount of work that our brains have to do. They do so much work already. So I like to give an example when we go to a restaurant of a, of a, a script and a mental schema that we developed. When we go to see, when we go to a restaurant, we would anticipate that a host or a hostess would uh, greet us and they ask if we have a reservation. If we have a reservation, we can anticipate that we'll be seated at approximately that time. And if we don't have a reservation, we can anticipate that we might have to wait. And when we are seated at our table, we anticipate that a waiter or waitress will ask us for our drink order and provide us with a menu and we move through the appetizers to the main dish to dessert, et cetera. And, and it's this, these schemas that we develop that help us to not have to think uh, too much about what it is that we're doing. And if we provide this schema for our students the, through the use of consistent and regular course design, we're allowing them to minimize how much cognitive workload they expend on navigating through each week's material and really focus on the learning of that material. Uh, so they know that each week you're gonna come in and you're gonna see this this item within your learning management system that tells you what to expect. And then you're gonna see the, the folder that contain all the videos that need to be watched and the folder with all of the uh, PowerPoints or other resources that we need. And then it's followed by a discussion or an assignment, et cetera. And it's in the same order every week. Um, you might have one or two different things, like you don't have an exam every week, maybe every third or fourth week, et cetera. But it's predictable enough that the students aren't overloaded with, with trying to figure out how to navigate. They're just focused on what they need to learn. Because when expectations of a schema are violated, as in the case of the restaurant, um, if, if they're, they have a reservation and they're not seated for another hour and a half, that violates our 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 schema, our, our mental shortcut. We anticipate that if we have a reservation, we should be seated. And we, then that results in frustration and maybe a terrible Yelp review. It's the same for students. If they go in and they can't find what they need where it's supposed to be or where it had been before, they get frustrated and sometimes they completely log out and don't log back in. And we don't want that for our students. We want to make sure that we're reducing the number of barriers that they have to overcome and all they have to do is focus on, on what we're trying to relay to them so that they can have a better learning experience. All right, so let's, let's get our order to go. What are the, the top takeaways that you can consider when you're developing online course materials? First, online learning and online teaching can be done well. It's, it's well documented uh, for, for courses, that have been designed with care and for instructors who provide their students with good feedback and are there responding to emails and chats, et cetera, uh, the learning can be the same, if not better, than face-to-face. -face. Remote instruction is about the teaching and not the technology. And this is really important to remember. Like technology is the tool we're using, but teaching and learning, that's the goal. Pedagogy, it's the pedagogy, it's the delivery of the, the learning material and the acquisition of the, the learning by the students that should be driving technology choices and adoption. And you know, you might see something and you're like, oh, that is so awesome. I want to implement that in my class. And that's great as long as it's meeting a pedagogical need, but really the, the adoption of technology into your uh, instruction should be driven by 
it meet the technology meeting a learning need. It's going to be different, and that's okay. It's it's absolutely uh, overwhelming to think about how different the online uh, display of materials and and remote teaching is from teaching in a, a classroom. It's going to be different, and yet it's still going to be okay if you just follow a couple simple steps and and your students are going to uh, do well. You should keep your learning uh, materials in mind. So when you're considering what course materials to create and what assessments to generate, all of those should tie directly to your learning outcomes or objectives that are stated uh, from the very beginning. Every task you have should be tied to a learning outcome. There's nothing worse for a student than to feel like they're doing busy work. As long as they understand that the work that's being expected of them helps them to meet those learning objectives that were stated, then students are, are more willing to buy into uh, doing that work. Tying those assessments or that work to your stated learning objectives uh, helps you to uh, remember the time on task for you and your students. Many of the students this spring reported that their workload increased drastically in the online environment as faculty tried to fit way too much in. Consider how much time your students will have to spend reviewing the materials that you provide them, uh, including the lectures, including all of the homeworks and all of the, the practice uh, tests, et cetera. Uh, consider how much time that's gonna take them and how much uh, time they still need to do to complete the work that's graded. And finally, consider how much time you will have to spend grading, interacting, and communicating with your students, because that's time on task as well. It's not just how much time your students are, are um, spending, it's how much time you'll be spending too. Creating a, a quality fully online course can take a lot of time, and and not we're not all necessarily creating those fully online courses. Maybe we're uh, trying to make some materials in the case that we have to move to remote again this fall. But regardless, that amount of work uh, can be as intimidating as this giant strawberry is to this, this tortoise. But if you divide the development and delivery process into these bite-sized chunks, you'll find it's very manageable. Uh, the Oscar rubric that I was mentioning earlier can help you do that. Remember that it's important to break your lectures and materials up into digestible chunks as well for your students. Um, consider cutting up your lectures into these 15 minute increments that provi and providing knowledge checks immediately afterwards. This fits best practices and, and fits what we know from cognitive psychology about attention spans and, and working memories and, and uh, students' ability to uh, absorb information at an optimum is in breaking that up into bite-sized chunks is very, very helpful to them. As you're developing your content, remember that creating a predictable, simple, and consistent template that carries over from week to week, module to module, will create a learning environment that minimizes the learning curve for students. If the course is random or overly complicated, students may waste time trying to navigate rather than interacting with the content and if you provide orientations and guides for your students, set expectations for each week and give them the instructions they need, it will cut down on the work you need to engage in later on when you, when you have to respond to tons of student email questions, and it may prevent you from losing students to, uh, to frustration. So you've seen how much work is required, but just remember that it's okay to start small. And just like in this image, that's a single snowflake here on the right, and on the left is this giant snow castle. Uh, if you currently have content, even committing to, a small, to small changes can make a huge difference. And if you're starting from scratch, creating this solid foundation will give you the freedom to add, continue to add more com complex and intricate content when you have more time in subsequent semesters. It's okay to just start with a really simple uh, snow castle and then eventually you develop this uh, snow Hogwarts here that we have here on the left. 
So thank you for your time today. And that's the end of my prepared slides, but I'm happy to take questions and, uh, and address those here. I see that the chat is kind of exploding, but. Uh, so one of the things I know a lot of people are thinking about is lectures, and you referred to lectures a little bit. Uh, do you have mm -hmm. more to say about that? Some people are delivering lectures synchronously, and many are doing them asynchronously. So I like to think about online lecture presentation the same that I would recommend to do in, in the classroom. It's, it's one thing to get up in front of a classroom and talk for 50 minutes straight and then release them out into the, the uh, hallways to then go digest that information and come back in the next class and do that the same. But truly a more interactive way of doing that is to present some information for a little bit, stop, ask questions, and then present more information and stop and ask questions. You can do the same thing with your synchronous online presentations if you're using Zoom or Collaborate or whatever. Uh, you treat that like you would your face-to-face -face lecture. You present some material, maybe ask students some questions about that, et cetera, and then move on. But when you're converting your lectures from synchronous face-to-face -face or synchronous online into an asynchronous format, what students tend to express frustration with is having to listen to 60 minutes. But if you would break up that lecture into 10 to 15 minute increments, followed by a quick knowledge check or just a question that they should consider, like what was the most important um, aspect of this particular topic? Or uh, say we presented, uh, I don't know, I've, I should have studied a little bit about math but before I gave this presentation, but talk about one concept for 10 minutes and then have students work through some problems um, and then um, to do a little self-check so that they know that if they need to listen to that portion of the lecture again before they move on to the next. So you breaking it, breaking it up into those chunks actually promotes uh, knowledge acquisition for your students. So that's an interesting example of what we've been talking about with the math community about formative assessment, which is a form of assessment that gives students feedback about their learning and gives you feedback um, about their learning as well. So you can a redirect course. So something like what Jamie suggested where you would um, give students a self-check activity, even if you didn't grade it or collect it, it gives them a chance to test their own understanding before they move on to either other concepts or other examples. Right. And then, and then they know whether or not they need to view that part of the video again, or if they, sometimes faculty will offer a pre-check. So if you're gonna cover a concept, you can say, try this out, see how well you do. And if they get it right, they might need, not need to watch that, that 15 minutes of video. And then they can just jump to the next one. So you can consider in addition to the, the post knowledge check, the pre-knowledge check as well. There have also been a couple of mentions about whether there are some exemplary online math classes to view. And I know you and I have discussed that in the past. Um, is that something that we can provide? I think that um, I'm working with another group within SUNY to develop an exemplar course material. And I know that we have some mathematics. I don't know how soon I can get you access to that, but I know they exist, but I'll, I'll do my best. So I'll follow up with Jamie about that. And if we can get some examples, I have one example of a hybrid course in, um, I think it was differential equations that I can share. And, um, but that was a hybrid course where they were partly face-to-face -face and partly online. So that'll, might be a good example for those of you teaching in that format. But if Jamie has other resources to share, um, I'll make sure to, to distribute those. One of the difficulties is that mathematics has been sort of a latecomer to online teaching. So there aren't as many examples as there might be in some other disciplines. Yeah, we have a lot of examples from statistics courses because those tended to go online before the other mathematics courses. Um, went online, but uh, not so much from like algebra and geometry and trig and, and calculus. But statistics might um, be close enough for the kinds of examples that 
people are looking for. So we should take a look at those. We consider statistics as one of the mathematical sciences, and at least from a point of view of the structure of teaching, there are a lot of similarities. There's one faculty member within SUNY who adopted an OER for his statistics course, and he has a lot of great data about how the implementing that open educational resource, that OER, into his course actually promoted student learning. Um, I think you interacted with him at those webinars a couple of weeks ago. His name is Dave Uzinski. He has done some great things, and it's really, um, his stuff is, is well done. All right, I'll see if he has stuff that he's willing to share. Uh, let's see. I see some so, people posting about Chegg. Yeah, there's a lot of concern about um, uh, about the integrity of assignments within the math community. Um, uh, proctoring and academic dishonesty have become big deals, especially since we uh, went to online learning just as people were starting to prepare for finals. Yeah. Um, there, there was a very clever um, example I saw where a TA, I think at Princeton, went on Chegg and posted incorrect solutions to a lot of the exam questions. And then he was able to see who offered those solutions up. Oh, interesting. And so in your online resources, do you also have examples of activities? Uh, people really want to, um, yeah, someone said that the, che the TA on Chegg was kind of entrapment. I I'm not advocating that. I just thought it was kind of a, it, it was an example of how much we're concerned about it. Um, are there examples within the SUNY uh, open source materials where um, we can see examples of how to do group work online and what kinds of formative assessment activities are available online? Yeah, I think that the, um... Topkit has some great examples as well, but I know that SUNY Online has um, materials. Alex Pickett has um, information on the COAT website. I'm not sure how updated that is, but I, I know that, that they are there. I can work on getting you links after this presentation if you'd like. That would be great. That would be great. If there are other topics that you'd like us to see us, the AMS Education Department, address through future webinars. I hope you'll share them with us. You can throw them into the, um, you can show them into the threat, into the chat, or um, email us separately. Uh, other questions for Jamie or other comments, things you want to, um, things that you're concerned about? I think one of the big points that might have gone by somewhat quickly at the beginning of Jamie's presentation is the idea to start with what your learning objectives are. Many of us approach um, teaching in mathematics as being start with, um, I want to cover chapters one through seven, which is a really different kind of, that's a teaching objective, that's not a learning objective, but to state I want my students to understand how what a derivative means and how to apply it in situations one, two, and three is a really important activity, whether you're teaching online or otherwise, because once you have your learning outcomes identified, that can really help drive the types of activities that you design, including assessment activities. Right, and then tying those assessments to those learning outcomes helps your student understand why they're doing what they need to do and then uh, increases their buy-in. So you're, you're achieving in two ways, them meeting that learning outcome, right? Increasing the buy-in and, and, and making sure that they understand why, and then you get to, you get to meet that intended learning outcome. And we also have some other webinars coming up later this month that will be um, more specific uh, activities to use. So these are some really good general principles around designing, how you get started designing an online course. And the word designing is really important. A lot of us didn't design our online courses in the spring. We were just in survival mode and, and did the best we could on very short notice. But if you're explicitly designing your course and planning it in advance to be an online course, these principles can be really helpful in guiding you to do that. 
And we'll have some other things going on throughout the summer that will help give you some more of those specific ideas. I see one of those is active learning in math courses that work in an online setting. Um, okay, one question uh, about advanced classes and whether there's an app for writing with a pen like in an iPad. I'll let other people respond to the technology questions. That's not something that Jamie or I can um, offer a lot on. But what I what I have used in the past is students will write things and they'll just take a picture with their phone and upload what they wrote. Um, and they can share them with each other that way. It's not as elegant as being able to do like a shared whiteboard kind of thing. Um, okay, a book about uncheatable assignments. Yeah, I think this is one, port one thing that's really important for us to think about when everyone's so concerned about cheating and we all know it goes on. And um, we need to keep in mind a few things. One is that cheating happens in the face-to-face -face classroom as well. Um, and online isn't going to be any different from that. Uh, and if we get too sophisticated in the systems that we build to try to prevent cheating, like all of the proctoring software and all of that, um, someone's going to view that just as a challenge to hack. <laughs> so thinking about things like what is an uncheatable assignment, I think can be really helpful. Yeah, um, Ray, thank you. There are some really, uh, there's great material on the MAA way, website, maa.org. If you look at their um, instructional practices guide, it's a downloadable book, I believe, a uh, free downloadable book, and they have a lot of examples in there that can be really helpful. Um, Ray, I don't, are those specifically geared toward online or they're general? They're general, okay, so, but still they might give you ideas for things that you can adapt to the online setting. Thanks for sharing that. There are some other really good um, resources that you're all sharing with each other and we're gonna post that along with the, um, with the link to the webinar um, soon. Um, and Ray from the Mathematical Association of America also says that there are um, some reading groups looking at how to adapt these activities for online. So uh, keep an eye not only on the AMS website that I've referred to, but MAA has a lot of really great teaching materials. So keep an eye there as well. Any other questions, comments? Okay, Ray said she'll pass information to me and I will share information to this group either by email or I'll post it on our page along with um, a webinar recording. So, well, thank you, Jamie. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, Thanks for having me. And looking at, at this presentation always makes me really hungry. There's no <laughs> sweets in the house, so, oh well. Um, and thank you all. Can you put up my last slide? If you would please. Yeah, just let me stop share here. Uh, so um, next week, we, the AMS Education Department is sponsoring another webinar that is on accessibility issues moving mathematics online. Um, so accessibility best practices for moving math online. It's next week at the same time, two o'clock. And if you want to find out more detail about it, go to ams.org slash education slash webinars. And you can read the description of that. We're also tr hoping to build, we're working on uh, a series of webinars throughout the summer. So thank you all for attending and um, good luck with planning for your fall courses. And again, thank you, Jamie. This was wonderful. Thanks, Abby. Have a good one. Bye, everyone. <laughs>